All right, we are live. Now, before we um, before we get started with our lecture tonight, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we have an amazing artist that I've been looking at for quite a while with us today, artist Elizabeth Geiger. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about um, this amazing artist. Uh, for one, she is... Um, she studied at the University of Virginia Vermont Studio Center and the New York Studio School. Um, and she alternates between painting for exhibitions and teaching and painting in both online and in person. And her work has been shown regularly throughout the Eastern United States and can be found at Gross McLeaf Gallery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So without further ado, Geiger, if you'd like, let me go ahead and spotlight you uh, for everybody, and let's go ahead and get on with the lecture. Great. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for asking me, first of all, um, to do this, and um, thank you guys for, for coming to listen. Um, so I titled, um, I titled the talk, um, The Power of Influence, because um, I feel like it's an important aspect of becoming and developing as an artist to study past art and sort of digest it and let it influence your work. That's it's very underrated. And I think for, for a lot of people, and maybe it's just in the, the teaching that I'm doing that's kind of workshop type, studio school type teaching, it seems to be the weak link for a lot of painters that they're not looking at and literally stealing from, frankly, uh, enough art, uh, other artists. Um, so why is it important to look at other artists and be influenced by them? And I would say, um, because it's just, making paintings is not just um, learning some skills, like perspective or how to mix colors and how dark and light and how to judge, hold up your ruler and measure things from the distance. You know, it's not, it's not just a bunch of skills that you're then applying to something that you're looking at and trying to reproduce on a canvas. It is a slow process of discernment, of learning aesthetic principles and discernment. And you learn those more, I think, by looking at great painters who did them, who embodied them. So that's studying art, copying paintings, um, going to museums. If you're not even a painter and you just want to appreciate it, looking at a lot of great painting will increase your aesthetic sensibility and your, your sense of discernment of what makes a good composition better than another. You just keep looking at those images and they will become um, in, they will kind of get get into your sort of brain and be there waiting when it's time for you to make a decision and you feel unsure, you're sort of stuck, you're facing some big landscape or, or a big still life setup or something, you've got the residue of all these images in there that have kind of been teaching you in a sense. So um, just like you wouldn't um, spend a year studying grammar really hard and learning vocabulary, learning one of those 30 days to better vocabulary thing and just, and then say, okay, I've learned grammar and vocabulary. I'm gonna become a poet now. It's like, that's not, you know, grammar, understanding how to dissect a sentence or whatever you call diagram a sentence isn't necessarily what prepares you to be a poet. Reading a lot of poetry prepares you to be a poet. Understanding the, you know, what, how, to, how you fit into that um, entire history of that art form. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say this is an early influence of mine, um, Louisa Mathias' daughter. And I remember very early on, like after graduating college, going to, um, I went to college at the University of Virginia and there's a town like an hour away called Lynchburg and it had Randolph making women's college there. And they had a show of um, artists from New York and it was a lot of big names. I can't remember them all, but I mean, I think maybe Paul Resica was in it. And I remember Joan Mitchell was in it. There was a lot of big name people and Louisa Mathias daughter was in it. 
and then some new up and coming younger kind of hot people at the time. And I, I went in and sort of stood in the middle of this huge room that the show was in and rotated around. And I saw these Louisa paintings and they just like almost knocked me over, like physically knocked me over. I could not believe how powerful they were. And I think that that always stayed with me. I think right then and there, it was almost like my compass was set where I wanted to go as a painter. I knew that I wanted to do very kind of powerful, um, bold, you know, painting like that. And um, let me just move on. Let's see. There we go. So um, if I'm going to talk about just some of my earliest influences, it's impossible to be married to a painter, especially a great painter, and not have them be an influence. That was absolutely one of my biggest influences was my husband. And, um, but early other than that, I mean, in terms of art history, Van Gogh was a definite um, first love of mine as a young painter and Matisse and people like Louisa Matthias Otter and Fairfield Porter, things like that. So, um, whoops, here's an early um, <clears throat> cityscape of my husband's. He did a lot of outdoor painting and then slowly started doing more figurative work when he, um, as he got older and started teaching more figure painting and figure drawing. And eventually um, he started doing more interiors, which is what he does now with um, figures in them. So I sort of, my life has been, you know, since I got married, um, having models coming over, watching my husband start painting, having the paintings leaning around, all every room of the house having paintings in process, um, leaning on the walls, seeing this constant, you know, around me has been a huge influence. And I think one of the big influences of it was to see how a painter works like steadily all the time, regularly, doesn't matter how you feel, <laughs> doesn't matter if it's raining or shining or whatever, you're just working. Um, and not, you know, waiting for inspiration, so to speak. Here's a, a great painting by Van Gogh that everybody probably knows. Um, I think that early on, like many people, what attracted me to painting was color. And I would um, look at very colorful painters, but also very expressive painters. I think I liked how expressive his work was with the mark making. And the mark making kind of emphasized drawing and seemed very decisive to me. So like Louisa Matthias Otter, that was something that a kind of clarity um, like that. Um, Matisse, again, very colorful. And um, yeah, so I would just look at a lot of um, books or go to museums as much as I could when I was a young painter. And I think being married to a painter helped because that's, we could both do that together and wanted to. And it just became, um, it just seemed natural after a while to like go look at art, um, either at books or, you know, go get art books from the UVA art library or go to DC and look at the National Gallery or something like that. So the, you know, the most important, I think the best advice I ever got as a painter was um, once when I was at the Vermont Studio School and Bernard Chait was there, who was a great teacher and great, he probably wrote my favorite book on drawing of all time, The Art of Drawing. And he was one of my husband's teachers when my husband went to grad school. So, um, and he said, you know, don't, um, he was asking me who I was looking at in terms of painting. And I think I told him my husband. And I, he was looking at a drawing that I had done, a tonal drawing that I had done with the side of my charcoal. And he said, you need to back up and go to the source. Don't look at trickle down information. Go back to whoever he was looking at, because it was obviously Surat. If he draws like this, he's looking at Surat. So basically his, his um, advice was go to the source and um, that means um, don't just look at people 
that you like, find out who they like and look at those people and keep going back and back and back as far back as you can um, and sort of almost back up the mountain <laughs> as, as much as you can and then work your way down from up there instead of staying at the base of the mountain and circling somebody that you, one person that you really like, keep expanding who you're looking at because you're just gonna get more and more rich ideas and influence on your painting, which is, I think, ultimately how you develop your style. If you're looking at a lot of painters and taking a little bit from this person and that person, um, you mix it all together. And especially the more people you look at, you can't tell after a while um, who you're looking at because you've just taken so many little pieces. It's like a recipe for, for you know some kind of like special recipe of spices like curry. Curry is like, curry isn't a spice. It is a group of spices and there's no one way to make it. There's probably infinite ways to make it. So you could make your own, you know, kind of, spice by taking a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I, I like the shapes in this kind of painter and I like the composition of that kind of painter. I like this. And you just keep adding them together. And all of a sudden you're going to have your own um, kind of flavor to your painting. So um, for example, Matisse really liked Cezanne, who I wasn't looking at originally and I started to. And Cezanne really like Claude Lorraine, who I started to look at. And I actually went to DC and made a copy of a Claude Lorraine painting, which I would have never in a million years done before, but I learned so much. I learned, completely learned about tone from doing that uh, copy. So, um, it, but it's also just looking at pictures isn't always enough. I mean, you have to kind of understand what you're looking at um, and not just take the superficial, well, Cezanne paints apples. So I'm gonna go get some apples and that's what I'm gonna paint. But it's more than that. It's like, what is he doing? How is he structuring these paintings? What is the compositional? What kind of compositions are you using? What's his tonal structure? What's the color? What's his color ideas? So in order to do that, I recommend a lot of, um, you know, either taking classes if you think you can um, learn that from the teacher, but also studying on your own, just like, looking at books that have more of an explanation quality to them. There are books, for example, on Cezanne's, you know, compositions or something like that. I, I wanted to note at the bottom here, I wrote um, Juliet Aristides books. If you've never heard of her, she um, has her own um, sort of atelier school on the West Coast and writes a lot of art books and they're very good. My husband used to, um, uh, require them in his classes. There are two that I got um, early on that was, one was called something like um, classical painting atelier and the other one was classical drawing atelier, but they're not that expensive. And I think on Amazon, they might even be 20 bucks. And it's just the reproductions alone are so good that it's worth 20 bucks just for those. But her writing is so good and clear about and she's very clear, like she'll have a chapter on tone and a chapter on line and a chapter on composition or whatever. So she's um, she's a great resource if you want to kind of dig a little deeper and read about these things. Um, anything from Dover Books that's in the art books, they, they do a lot of great little books for artists, um, maybe a book on anatomy for if you're a figure person. There was a great book about um, the Anatomy of Trees that I got one time. It's it's an older book. I don't know if it's still in print, but it was just so helpful when I started painting landscape. And then I discovered someone a few years ago on YouTube that um, does pretty regular videos. I don't know if they're once a week or what, but he's um, a great teacher of kind of classical type, uh, you know, painting. And I think he calls himself an impressionist painter, but I just think of him as kind of a traditional uh, person, traditional kind of painter. And even if that's not how you want to work, I highly recommend you check out his videos because they're very specific. They can be anywhere from 20 minutes to 30, you know, something like that. They're short, but um, they're very specific. Sometimes they're about, you know, color intensity. How do you know the, the intensity 
rating of a color? How do you, how do you, color? you know, they're just very specific. It might be a, an entire video about an artist that he likes, um, Sargent or someone like that. And, but you can really learn some um, principles from watching them. And even if you want to be a very modern kind of, you know, avant-garde, rule-breaking, whatever kind of painter, you better know what the rules are if you're going to break them. So look at these things because it's only going to help you. You can't, it's not going to make you a worse painter to understand how, because every painter in, in until about five minutes ago had to do this, had to go into another artist's studio and be their apprentice and learn exactly how that artist did it. And then they had to study for years, you know, alongside them, do the backdrop background and, and convince everyone else that this artist actually made that tree in the background when it was really you. So they were, this is not, this is how it's always been. And then they would leave, let that go, go on their own and make their own work, which would have been different. So um, I don't have any problem with learning um, styles that you don't necessarily think you really want to do because you'll learn something from doing that and copying things like that. All right, so let me just move on. So here's an example of a print by Hokusai that was widely available um, in the 19th century and it influenced the prints that were coming out of um, you know, Asia were very influential to, um, po you know, the kind of impressionists and post-impressionists. And so um, Van Gogh was looking at this and you, you can see on the side, like your eye kind of comes in, follows this boat down, jumps to the other boat, loops back up and then follows a spiral of this wave. And if you look at the um, Starry Night, he's doing that exact thing. Um, he's mimicking that uh, you you come over on the mid middle of the canvas over here. You kind of loop down, follow these you know these hills and stuff down past the town, up the tree, and then spiral. He's doing that same structure. He studied and digested what Hokusai was doing. He didn't mimic water and boats. He didn't. It wasn't the subject matter. He was understanding what Hokusai was doing, and he was copying that. Um, so here I am early on, just after I graduated, um, I went to the New York studio school and did a drawing marathon where we worked, you know, on big sheets of paper and glued them together. And, um, and so this is a painting that I was a figure painting I did when I came back from that and I was still taking paper. The paper was actually this big. You can sort of see the line there. And I just glued another paper above to extend it. And um, I would get models sometimes, sometimes I'd paint myself, um, but I kind of always had a still life in it. I was just painting everything. Sometimes there was a window behind with a landscape. I would paint anything and everything all at once. Um, I did literally paint the wall of my little room that I was painting in, this little purple and pattern thing. So um, I was very much an observation painter. But um, but I was working very quickly, one shot paintings mostly, and stacking up painted. You know, this was acrylic. Um, I think I was probably less precious than some people might be when they start out. I think that a lot of people get very concerned about their materials and wasting, or what should I do? That what should I use this or that? And I was just kind of trying to knock out as many things as I could just to get better. And I think that was because I was living with a painter and saw that that's how he worked. He wasn't precious about his stuff. He just made a, made as many paintings as he could and started things and you know that that process. I think I absorbed that. I would um here's another drawing that I glued sheets together. It was just pastel um probably a little bit of a Louisa, you know, um, influence there. She would look in a mirror and paint self portraits and and, and not always have her face in it. Um this was maybe a typical size for me, 16 by 20. My paintings weren't huge at the beginning, but I would work uh, fast and painterly. I remember this was at the end of a long day with my two toddlers and I was exhausted and I was just like frustrated that I hadn't been able to paint that day. So I just went down after I put her to bed at like nine or something and knocked this out in like half an hour. I was just like, oh, and it felt so good to like do just a little bit of painting. Um, I hope that's... Not too fuzzy. 
Well, this is another painting that was probably, I don't know, uh, 16 by 18 inches or something, but this is would be a typical early painting for me, smallish, it's kind of squarish. I remember I really liked squares early on. And um, and I, I can see myself, the influence of Louise and Matthias are the bold shapes and colors and things like that. Um, so let me see. Uh, then my paintings start to get more, um, just a little bigger and a little more complicated. And I, I have to say something because I just forgot that one of the questions that I was given a list of questions just to get me thinking of what I could talk about. And one of them was what's a pivotal, what was a pivotal moment in your career or what, you know, something like that. And there's probably been more than one, but I, I just want to make sure I say that I think that one of the most important things that I did, choices I made, that influenced my career and my painting was to get married instead of going to grad school. I was thinking about going to grad school and, um, you know, was probably not ready for it yet. So I needed to work on my portfolio. But, um, you know, after a while, like the one of the main reasons to go to grad school in an MFA in painting is to get the credentials to teach. And I really wasn't um, looking for that. Uh, teaching wasn't my goal. So I just wanted to paint. And by choosing to not go and to actually stay at home, in a sense, I got more painting. Because I think if I had gotten an MFA, I would have felt pressure to get a teaching job and teach. And then I probably would have had less time to actually paint. It sounds counterintuitive, but... Um, but all I know is every friend that I have that's a higher level art teacher, you know, in a college level, is says that bemoans the fact that they don't have enough time to paint. So maybe that was all for the better that I didn't end up going to grad school because even though I had kids and it sounds like that would be super busy, it's like yes, the mornings I'd have to get them ready and get them off to school, and at the end of the day we'd have to a lot to do. But between nine and three, when the kids were gone, I was in the studio. And so that became, they really, children actually helped me um, structure my life and get down to business in the studio instead of just, you know, puttering around with my, you know, CD collection or something for half an hour and be going, oh, what do I want to lose? It? Like there was no messing around. I just got in there and got going because I knew I didn't have all the time in the world. So anyway, this is back to this painting. I, I look at this and I think, of all of the influences that I probably was thinking about and looking, I'll bet you that I had books. You know, there's uh, a lot of paintings by Bonard with red and white checkered cloth in it. Um, Fairfield Porter oftentimes had things like milk containers and everyday, you know, food kind of things like that. And I know Louisa Matthias daughter had a painting with a toaster. In it. So I just, I probably had been looking at a bunch of painting books and just put together a bunch of things that I liked out of them. Um, and, you know, I definitely wanted to have a more, um, less formal look. I remember that a very kind of casualness and a painterliness. And so avoiding, now that I look at this, I think there are some like this, lining this up with this edge of this pan does create a vertical, but I, I remember consciously trying to make more diagonals than horizontals and verticals but um, things like that. So uh, here I am in a room off of our kitchen, which had great north light. And I just, it was the playroom that the kids played in when they were little. But once they got older, I just took it over and said, no, sorry, <laughs> I want to paint in here. But I, I'm putting these side by side because they were actually painted close in time to each other. But um in, in the exact same spot, like the corner of the room was identical. And this is, this just shows what I was thinking about and influenced by what came out. So I, I don't think in general, um, I think that this came after the one on the left, after I'd spent a while um, painting the painting landscape. And I don't think I could have made a painting like that until um, I did, spend some time painting landscape because 
the atmosphere, the sense of air, the softness, the lost edges, um, the subtlety, all, you know, landscape painting taught me a lot. And even though I don't do it as much, it helped my still life painting. It changed it. So um, that's just something to know that you can try different things and you don't have to say that you're hundred percent going to go that way. I just was experimenting with landscape painting and like looking at it. And it's an influenced my work too, in terms of just composing. Like I, I tend to almost mentally think of my tables as landscapes now, like almost like a, you know, organic sort of landscape grouping on a table. And this was something that I was just interested in experimenting with is modernism. And it was really hard at the time when I first started doing it, it was so counter every instinct that I had as a painter. I was like, what? But it really, um, it was just something I wanted to understand by doing it. And so every decision, I think it's, the, it's almost like the, the opposite. A lot of painting that we look at now, that traditional type painting is recessive. It's about making space. It's going back in space. And everything about modernism is pushing forward. Everything pushes up against the canvas. So um, if you wonder why there'll be wonky, funny things like that, the table edge should actually keep going out to here, but instead it jumps over and goes, comes back a little bit. That is to flatten it up against, you know, anything that anything that creates space goes against the modernist push forward. So this, this type of painting is pushing back. This is pushing forward. And it was just an interesting lesson to learn it. I just had to keep almost saying out loud, like, no, because I feel myself, if I don't think, and I just go on autopilot, this is what I'll do. But I had to think literally every minute of the, it was like my brain would hurt sometimes. It was like tingling because I was like, no, I have to, I had to do the reverse of every instinct I had. So it was, it was an interesting experiment. I'm still kind of doing it now. Um, this is an early painting, maybe one of my favorite early paintings. Um, not so early, but earlier. And um, I was working in the basement of this house with, in a little cinder block room that was a bump out, an addition to the house that was designed just to put a lawnmower in. Um, so I took over this little eight foot by 10 foot room and it was very low ceiling. So I all those paintings are I'm really looking down, but I wanted to kind of look along a table, kind of have it going back and, um, and I, that was because I was looking at this Bonard painting and I didn't necessarily know if I liked it or not, but I didn't really understand it. And I wanted to try to make my own version of it. And, you know, because I was looking at things like, why would you take something in the foreground and make it almost invisible, almost disappearing and unimportant so that your eye just jumps over right to the center and then up to the top? Like he's, he's pushing you back instead of the traditional way of like the most important things in the foreground. So, um, so I was doing that. This, this is kind of bleached out and your eye just kind of jumps to here. The, the most contrast things in this painting are this black scissors against the white here and this white salt against the black bottle. So it, it forces your eye to go here, then back there, which is um, kind of unusual. And, and not necessarily traditional. Um, there was a lot of food in uh, my still lives and I think Louisa is that way too, um, but uh, Louisa Mathias daughter, but I, I was also a chef in college. That was another thing they said, what kind of pursuits did you do at the time when you were learning to paint? And mine was cooking. And I think that I always thought, you know, if I can't find anything else to do, I would become a chef, but, um, but so I, I would stand in the kitchen at this restaurant I worked at in front of a table full, looking down this table full of like red peppers or something. And I'd be like, wow, those are so cool. And I, I'd be chopping them, but just, I think that image, I always have that image of this cornucopia like spilling out in front of me that I was um, cooking with. And so, I don't know, I just, it just appealed to me um, as a subject matter. Um, this, is a Diebenkorn painting. It's one of my favorite Richard Diebenkorns. It's a little painting of a knife in a 
glass of water. And that's that returns, I just took that um, and used that idea um, many times in early paintings. Um, this was a strange painting because I actually, <laughs> It's the only time this has ever happened to me, but I actually dreamed that I set this painting up and painted it. And I literally went to my studio the next morning looking for it and saying, where's that painting? And I, I said to my husband, like, did I paint a, a fish yesterday and like some eggplant and what? Did you see a painting that I made? Did I move it? And he goes, no, I don't think you did that. I was like, what? And it just kind of freaked me out, but I ran out and bought this stuff and put it on the table. And it was like, I made this painting so fast, like in a day because I'd already painted it. I'd watched myself mix the colors, decide what to put. And I was like, this is so weird, but I don't know what happened. It just, it didn't, I'm almost glad that didn't keep happening to me because it freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> but here's another fish painting. I, I've always liked painting fish. There's just kind of a genre of fish painting. And sometimes they're like Spanish. This was, I was looking at Spanish painters for sure, almost with a grotesque um, aspect to them. But um, I don't know, I just, and I think there was something about painting something that is literally rotting in front of me. You do not want to um, have a fish sitting around for too long. So you gotta, it just puts some pressure on you to just like having, hiring a model, like there, you only have a certain amount of time and they're gonna be gone. So I, I didn't want to have things that were just so, um, that would just remain the same and I, I wanted the pressure of having something that was decaying right in front of me or something like a plant or flowers that were sagging after a while. Um, here's a painting that I did, I think after I was thinking that I wanted to, I can't remember if this was around the time that I made that Claude Lorraine copy, but I wanted to expand my um, tonal range and include more darks in my paintings. I was sort of, finding that I was adopting almost the impressionist type of keeping in the middle or up high key with a few dark notes, but I wanted to sort of have a full, feel like I could use darks and actually like the, the colors that I was making that were dark. And so I set up a, a table and I put the spotlight down at the bottom, you know, toward the front so that the table itself was getting darker. And then I put objects that were darker in the background. Um, so um, something just came up about closed captioning, but okay. And so anyway, I just, it was, it was a kind of a concept that I had that I was doing with this painting, putting lighter objects in the front and darker objects in the back, but also that mimicking that with the spotlight being in the front. Let's see, come on, there. And this is a much newer one. I think this was from last year. Um, and I'm kind of happy to see that it does still have remnants of Louisa Mathias' daughter's influence in it because there's a, there's a real simplicity and geometry to the shapes and a kind of monumentality to them. Uh, there's also a boldness of the color, but instead of going with lighter uh, in the background, which she often does, I, I sort of went darker because I've been looking at a lot of Dutch uh, Dutch still life, um, like Dahim. And what I like about looking at these is that they're they're really complicated, but what they're really doing is jamming a bunch of things. What he does, he'll jam a bunch of things together, but into one big shape. So he's he kind of made almost like a wedge here, like a triangular wedge. And yeah, I just love that lobster too. Right. And and something about the darkness dark mm -hmm. you know it can like hold up, allows these bright and bold colors to hold up against it if this were something you know it there's a weight color has weight and this dark you know black has a lot of weight but so does red red almost functions like black sometimes in like modernist painting but if you want to have a lot of bold colors it's probably a good idea to have darks in your painting too um, so I was doing that, but my wedge was kind of the reverse. It was like a triangle facing the other way here, grouping them together. Um, unlike the, the even sort of spreading out that some people like Louisa does. But there's other painters that do that too. This was a Dutch painter, Van Schooten, who kind of laid things out in 
like row, you know, a little bit spread out evenly rows. And I'm obsessed for some reason, I'm obsessed with this painting right now. And I'm just making several versions of it, but like things like this with just bold colors. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing right now is in reinterpreting. I'm almost doing like mashups of older work with modernist, um, you know, aesthetic, things like looking at a Picasso, having an old Dutch painting and a Picasso taped to my wall while I'm painting and then seeing if what happens if I mash those two together. Um, here's some pictures from my studio of some setups. And I think what I'm noticing here is that I can tell that I've been looking at sort of Dutch painting by the one on the left because I've pulled back so much from the objects that they're now a smaller proportion of the painting and the, the space around it is more important and letting this, you know, this swag here and this to the straight door, like all these bigger shapes around the still life um, are important too. And not just the stuff, which a lot of times early on, I might've gone in here and focused just on this one little thing, this one, you know, couple of oranges right here, or this plate, this is what I would have painted early on, but pulling back and pulling back, I'm enjoying doing that. And I think it's because I've looked at other painting that has done that. Um, same with the thing on, on the right, thinking about the background as much as the stuff. So I might work on paper if I have a new setup and start more directly making some kind of black and white tonal copy of it just to kind of understand the light and then take baby steps toward making it a color painting, a uh, crazier color painting, maybe colors that aren't the right colors in the painting. And then something like this, this was probably like six paintings later, I could get to something like this. If I was thinking about Picasso, say, or somebody like that, I can't just walk in and do this on the right when I'm looking at a normal thing. Like, I, ha I have to understand it first and then distort it. So um, just so you know, that's um, that's kind of uh, what I'm doing here with, with my newer work is playing with distortion and color. And, and by using sort of quote, the wrong colors, it really is allowing me to develop a color idea before I start painting and then apply like mix those colors and make myself use them no matter what I'm looking at, like apply a color idea to what I'm looking at. And I might get color ideas from looking at other paintings or just mixing colors that I like and saying I'm going to use these or something like that. Here's me working in one of my two rooms that are in the attic. Um, yeah, I'm setting up looking at a spotlit painting here. But what's funny is behind me is that painting I was just <laughs> showing you that had the drape that was like, uh, you can see the setup right there, the, the can, uh, cabbages, whatever in the bottles. And this was that drape that was actually a lot darker in the painting. Um, this was something I started doing when I was teaching online was because um, people wanted to see me mixing. And I was, I was like, they'd either see the canvas or they'd see what I was looking at, or that it took me a while to figure out how to have my palette and the painting piece of paper I was painting on, on the same board. And the maybe the camera would be behind my shoulder and they'd be seeing this and then a little bit of this. So they kind of would see what I was painting, how I was mixing it and the painting all at once. And, but this is a good way to talk about um, maybe some studio practices, which is color mixing is a big part of my studio practice. It's usually how I start any day in the studio that isn't going to be a chore day. And there are a lot of those too, by the way. Um, but for example, like I set up this setup to be with the idea that it was more of a green and red setup in terms of complementary colors, but I was going to paint it using yellows and purples. So I mixed a ton of purples from my blues and reds, not really using, maybe there was one, um, but trying not to use a bunch of purples out of the two, but mixing them. And then I also, another thing that I do a lot more now is when I lay out the colors, whatever they are, I make tints of them. Tints means you add white and have versions that are lighter and lighter and lighter. So um, if I have 
multiple tints of every color on my palette. It just makes mix. It does take me a little longer to set that up, but it saves me so much time later and makes mixing so much better. I mix better colors because if I've got a blob of color in here that I want and I know I just want to make that a touch cooler and then I take my palette and I can stick it into this, I'm going to ruin the whole color. The whole color is going to turn blue. But if I just have a little light, you know, barely kind of light blue and I touch that and then I put it in, it doesn't ruin all the work that I've just done mixing that color that I'm trying to use. So I've just found this very helpful. And it also helps me constantly think about tone. I might say um, this color needs to be uh, cooler, but then I look at all these options and I go, well, does it need to be cooler and darker or cooler and lighter? or cooler and medium, you know, it makes me, forces me to think about tone as I'm mixing and put them together, uh, tone and, and color. Um, here's the other room. There's two sort of rooms and I'm convinced they were like servant quarters or something in this house. We bought this old house and uh, um, they, they're both kind of that, whatever that roof line thing is. Um, but um, so here is an example of how much, what might it might look like when I'm working in my studio. I'm just surrounded by stuff. And literally, I almost have to carve out a space when I go in in the morning to find where am I going to stand? And I have to push tables aside. I have so many tables now that I've accumulated. And a lot of stuff, a lot of fake fruit, uh, fake pineapple. This might, might have actually been real, but and fake flowers and real plants. I get real flowers sometimes, and fake, but I just, I like to have stuff around that I can um, look at and move around and. I don't know, I just like having this stuff around me. So I might, and here you can tell, I might have a poster of a painting that I like up and it might not be a still life. It might be this landscape by Corot, but I either have a book or a poster taped to the wall or something. So it's almost like I have one eye on my painting that I'm making and one eye on another image that I'm thinking about. And I sort of see it as, um, all the skills, the drawing, the color mixing, things like that are vehicles for, you know, if I'm gonna make an analogy of like a trip, I'm going somewhere, they, they help me get where I'm going. But looking at these paintings alongside me, um, these are like how I can travel, but this, these paintings are sort of telling me like, where am I going? And so they kind of remind me in a big picture kind of way, like, what am I trying to do here? What's the idea that I'm trying to channel, you know, pursue here? Am I, um, you know, what's the tonal idea or the um, scale idea or the color idea or something like that? It's just a kind of reminder of um, something that I'm interested in thinking about while I'm making a painting about something else. Um, there's the same, same room. So in terms of where I'm going, what's happening, um, there's a whole lot happening for some reason in March. It's like the month of all months. But here's my website. Again, if you haven't looked at it, it's, it's a little bit older, out of date, a little bit older work, but it's still good to look at. And I need to update and put newer things. I definitely add my newer work more to my Instagram. Um, which is Elizabeth Geiger Studio. And I definitely advertise any kind of shows, workshops, talks, all that kind of stuff on my Instagram. So that's a place you can go to check um, what I'm doing. I just joined this group, Perceptual Painters, that my husband was in. And um, they have a really cool, they didn't have an Instagram account yet. And we decided to make one starting this year, I think at the beginning of this year. And we decided instead of like randomly everyone just, you know, putting stuff on uh, posting, we decided to hand off the kind of um, the Instagram to, per, to each artist in turn. So like for two weeks, each artist would have a two week little studio visit um, and then pass it to someone else. And so I actually started it. I was the first one that did it. And there's a great, I put a lot of effort into it. And you might want to, if you want to go to that Perceptual Painters Instagram account and scroll all the way back, I don't know if that, how hard that would be, to the beginning, that would be my um, turn. And I really tried to show people all the different aspects of my studio and what I did there. There's an entire day just on my palette 
how I do it, how I organize it, how I clean it, how I what I think about it. There's, um, you know, painters that I like and discussions in the chat thing below about that. There's just a lot of information in that that you could see more about literally my studio practice and that. Um, they're also having a group show in, Cal in California at this Shasta College. I don't know if anybody that sees this video is a West Coast person, but in Redding, California, there's going to be a show in March. Um, and I'm actually going to go to teach finally in person after like three years at um, in Nashville, um, which is kind of near uh, Arkansas, if you guys if anybody here is from Arkansas, I'm gonna teach at the Warehouse 521 uh, in the last four days of March. And it'll sort of be like a, the first day we'll focus on drawing, totally drawing, and then sort of shift into painting as each day goes by. And then I'm having a, a solo show that was postponed from December at my gallery, Gross McLeaf Gallery in March as well. So there's a whole lot going on in March, <laughs> but, um, so those are things um, that are upcoming. And let me see, why does this not, oh, there. And I, I think I wanted to end on, um, instead of just talking about why maybe the, I use the medium or something like that, oil paint or something, I, I think it's important to, uh, to just talk. I like thinking about the question of just why paint at all? Or even if you're not a painter, why look at painting? Why is painting important? Um, and to me, it, it's a way to make sense of the world. Um, it's, it's always been a way for me to put sort of chaos into order somehow. I think that everybody uh, increasingly is living very fragmented lives. We're, we're busy, we're doing many things. And um, I think technology on top of it just makes everything increasingly sped up and sort of complicated. And there's just something about good painting going and looking at good painting in person that slows you down. It sort of um, puts everything back in place and uh, each fragment of a painting is unified, is a part of a unified whole. It's organized consciously and it just, there's something so comforting about that. Um, and it just kind of, uh, I think art really leaves us feeling connected, I feel connected to the world by looking at it. And it, um, I feel like I have a place in the world. I'm included. There's just a sense of that that I, I feel when I look at great painting. Um, I think beauty in general really asks you to stop thinking about yourself. It gets you out of yourself. And so even though I spend my days alone in my studio, I feel like because making art takes me out of myself. I feel more connected and, and not kind of self-obsessed when I've spent time in the studio. Um, well, I, ultimately, yeah. ultimately, I think that one of the real ultimate purposes of art, of great art, is to remind us um, that life is worth living. I really believe that. That's the one. On the days where we have forgotten that. <laughs> So I highly recommend to everyone, painters and non-painters, to go and see painting in person because it does make a difference um, seeing it in person at a museum or things like that. All right, so thank you very much. And I'll answer any questions you want. Should I unshare now? Stop the share? So uh, yes, go ahead and uh, stop the share. So anybody who is um, who is kind of talking can kind of share their um uh, voice. I will say that there is a couple of uh, there is a couple of questions on, um, or at least a couple of comments uh, on Facebook Live, and I'll go ahead and and kind of share those. Um, you know, April Burris uh, said, "This is so affirming to me. Um, thank you for bringing this part of your life up." And 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 I believe she's talking about you know the kind of aspect of of motherhood and um, painting. And Amy says the same thing, Amy Scoggins. Uh, this is a conversation about mother and being an artist that April Burris and I have daily. Um, so uh, it's kind of like thanking you for talking about that. I okay. think that's very important <laughs> as well. And then uh, Laura Mae Waddles, um, she says, uh, I've been learning to really appreciate still life paintings and this helps quite a bit. 
So, um, you know, I, I really love, um, uh, you know, what you've said, and I think I'm going to give uh, the floor to anybody who have any questions. Now, if you have, if you're kind of shy, I'll keep an eye on the chat and then, um, you know, you can, you can have your answers uh, or you can ask your questions there. We do have one question so far um, by uh, uh, Marie. Um, she says, what was the name of the last artist you showed? Uh, the tabletop with the muscles. Yeah, I just typed it in. The, it's I. Oh. Forget, it's like four names, but his last name is Van Schuten. I can't remember <laughs> his first two names, but Van Schuten. But anyway. Oh, this one's really good. Um, Peter says, I'd love to hear you talk about the difference between painting things and painting shapes and colors. <laughs> that's a great um, yeah, that's comment really because great. that's exactly what's happened over... Um, time for me is that when I started painting, um, I was painting things. The things were what mattered. And I actually remember one day my husband saying, why don't you stop painting stuff? And I would literally start the painting with all the things in the center. And there wouldn't even be stuff around. Like I wouldn't even paint everything out. And he was like, I just remember him coming up one time. He said, would you stop painting this stuff? And I was like, what do you, it's a still life painting. What do you mean? He goes, why don't you try starting painting everything else and don't paint the stuff, okay? Because you're not paying enough attention to the everything else. And that's half the painting. So I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> but once I started doing that, I realized, oh, I really am ignoring, um, ignoring the rest, the background. And it became more and more interesting to me to focus on the, those shapes, um, the background shapes, the, uh, the shapes of shadows, on the table, the table shape itself. Um, and that became like, I think it, the more I studied composition, the less I cared about the things, the more I cared about the shapes I was making, whatever those shapes were, background, foreground, table, under the table, and the tones and the colors, it just became an arrangement of shapes. And so um, less so about literal, stuff the literal subject matter of the stuff and i'm not saying i don't want to go back like this behind me is a new painting right there that i'm working on and it's it, i think it's done but um i'm not saying that i permanently forever want to stay in this modernist mode but i'm just finding it interesting and i'm hoping that if i circle back eventually to just more straightforward realism that it'll do something to the my paintings you know i'm just curious to kind of go back now after a year of studying and looking at these painters that i wouldn't have looked at before picasso wasn't someone that i spent a lot of time looking at um but um if i just now go in to do a straightforward observation painting i'm just curious what choices i would make um because i don't think i can totally forget the things that i've been doing now but anyway, it's just all experimenting. I, I love experimenting. I, that's why I love starting paintings and being in the middle of paintings, finishing them. That is my least favorite part because I like, I could sit forever and just keep going, well, I don't know, maybe I can make, make it dark on this side and light on the other. No, no, actually, what if I made the whole thing down low? Like I could just shift and totally change paintings constantly. And almost yeah, like... Thomas Edison, you know, supposedly he tried 700 different things as a filament for the light bulb. I mean, if I tried five, I'd be like, ah, screw it. Maybe the light bulb's a dumb idea, whatever. <laughs> you know, he did 700 different things to what would burn and stay lit in a light bulb. And that's almost how I feel. I've adopted a kind of scientific, like, I don't want to think of myself as an artist. Like, I want to think of myself as like Thomas Edison. I'm in a, I'm in a laboratory. What would happen if I put red over here and then or no red over here and you know i don't know just i'm constantly mm -hmm. thinking of um experiments that i could make on the canvas and i think what what's so hard for me about having a deadline having a show is that i have to stop doing that in a sense and just okay this is what i'm doing nail it finish it nail it and i can't constantly pull the rug out from under myself and um so they're both good practices to do, but it's like, I have to Thanks. literally mentally shift from playing and experimenting into finishing mode. And it's 
it's always a painful shift for me to make, but once I've made it, I'm okay. I think uh, we have another question. Ken, did did you, do you have your hand raised? I sure do. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so I have like two questions and I feel like one you'll be able to answer really quickly. So I'll ask that one first. So how do you register for that in-person workshop that you're doing in March? Oh, you know what? I'm not totally sure. I could probably, I'll try to follow you on Instagram and message you, but it's, I right. just would guess that there must be a five, do the, the warehouse five. Right, right. must have a website or something I don't I'm sorry I don't know yeah yeah okay we'll follow up um yeah because I live in Kentucky so I'm not really that oh, far awesome. and, my, and my parents live close to Nashville so awesome. um yeah so my second question is why does composition matter um well it's kind of the underlying structure of of the work and it actually um sets a lot of the mood and tone more than people think it's not people think the problem with painting is that people will look at a painting and see the subject matter or the color and say that's a great painting you know it's about this or it's about when they don't understand that's behind the scenes it's like saying why does it matter who directed a movie well the greatest directors made amazingly made spectacular movies because they were the ones thinking about not thinking about the storyline as much as what's the big sweeping you know mood of this movie how am I going to get that mood to you know you have to kind of use the composition a lot of times to create the drama um and you know my husband would oftentimes start um people are oftentimes surprised to find out that he starts his interiors without the model there he just create he starts painting the room and then the model will come over and he'll just flunk the model here there and move him around and he's already created the drama of the painting before the model's gotten there because he's making the composition. He's figuring out where are the diagonal, where are the big divisions? Where's the big angle? What's, um, what's the space like? All of those things are kind of compositional things. And you can't, um, I think the reason why it's good to study it is because if you don't consciously think about it, it's not just going to magically happen. You're going to get pulled in. As soon as you have something in front of you that you want to paint and you've got your colors and you're mixing and there's just too many things to do that you won't accidentally make a great composition, it's not going to happen. You have to think about that on its own, maybe before, maybe during, maybe after, whatever. That's why doing a lot of thumbnails and drawing is helpful and studies and things like that because it just ends up... Um, it's almost like it creates more um, emotional power or something like that in the, in the work. That's what I would say. Hmm. That's sometimes, that's... you know, when I go to, because there's composition is abstract. It's not literal. So when you're composing, you're composing shapes. And when I go to a museum and I see great painting, the thing about, fine art, what, what makes art fine art, maybe versus illustration, which can also be good too, but fine art is meant to have, um, you know, um, kind of the abstract, the kind of um, shapes and colors and things like that come to you first. When you see a great painting from across the room, you might see the big shapes of it, the big divisions of it first, and then you realize what the subject matter is. You might, it takes you a minute to go, oh, I didn't realize like there was a Giorgione painting I saw one time and it was just this amazing sort of rocky, desolate looking landscape and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden this little thing down at the bottom was like, oh, it's the Adoration of the Shepherds around G. Like I didn't even know this from across the room what the subject was. I was just seeing how he made the sky and the rocks all on the you know right side and stuff like that. And it's, Illustration, the purpose of it is for you to, um, it's to tell a story or to convey an idea um, first. So when you see a, an illustration, it can be a good illustration. It's just you're, the subject matter is important and you're supposed to know that, understand and absorb that subject matter instantly. A painting is supposed to be the reverse. A fine art painting is supposed to be, you absorb the um, kind of building blocks 
the shapes, the colors, the forms first, then the subject matter second. And I guess that's why um, studying composition can really help you do that, to get away from just focusing on that subject matter first kind of mentality. Hmm. Anybody yeah, that's, we got a couple questions in the chat. Um, Peter Colum asks, how do you know when a painting is finished? Uh, Ooh, that's a good one. Because <laughs> yeah. um, the gallery says it's, I got to get it there in like a week. <laughs> that's how I know. Then I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, a lot of times it is something like that, but I, yeah. um, I will put them aside. I'm better now at putting them aside because I'm working longer on paintings. I'm not a one-shot painter anymore. So I will put them aside and then pull it out later and if something jumps out at me, sometimes I turn them upside down. I look them backwards in a mirror constantly. I have mirrors in every room of my studio up there, all over the place, so that I see them in reverse. Like, I just, if something looks off um, when I haven't looked at it in a while, or I look at it upside down, or, I, you know, I mean, for me, for a long time, it was like, Bill, does this look done? Like, you just, <laughs> I go to... My husband asked, do you think I need to do that? You know, for a long time it was that, but now I'm trying to do it myself. And I just, uh, I don't always know. And, but I'm starting to get the inkling that if I push too much, that I kind of can ruin it. Like I'm actually, I used to just work and work and work. And now I'm trying to like slow down a little bit and let myself think about it and just switch to another painting. If I'm not sure where to go, Sometimes I can be painting and feel like I'm just moving sideways on this painting. I'm not progressing. So that's when I just put it aside. And um, one of my teachers, George Nick, would always say, there is no such thing as overworking a painting. Only under, if it's not working, you keep working it until it's done. <laughs> so we always said that. But um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I can kill a painting if I keep working too long. I like the terminology of working sideways because yeah. people always think you go forward or I back. Like I was treading water. I'm like, totally say, I'm just treading water here. What am I doing? I'm just changing or mixing the same color, close mm -hmm. color, put it on top of the same color on top. I'm like, oh. so I just, I know then that I'm not really attacking it anymore. I'm not seeing it anymore. So I just put it aside and look at something else. But I'm getting better at like, um, if I just glance at it and nothing bugs me about it, then I'm like, okay, maybe that's actually close. <laughs> we got another uh, comment in chat um, by uh, Michelle, and she says, do you have any suggestions for how to study composition? Um, yeah, read books. I, I happened to be in a college town for, you know, up until five years ago, we moved a little ways away from Charlottesville, but I would go constantly to the art library um, and maybe there's, I bet you there's a lot of these books online. If you start looking, there's a lot of online sort of libraries of old books. But I started looking at the oldest books I could find. I would go to maybe the composition section and look for this little dusty old battered book and look at the <laughs> date. And it was like a hundred years old. And I was like, this is the one I'm reading. So I would look at the oldest books I could find, oftentimes written by British guys. And so it was very kind of, this is how you do it. And even if I knew that I wasn't eventually going to always paint like these people, I wanted to know what, a, you know, what the traditional rules were that were taught. And so I, I read num number of books. I recommend teaching a workshop on composition. And then you learn really fast. <laughs> That's what I did. And I was like, yeah, so I started teaching about it and that made me learn, but just reading and looking at, I'll bet you if you look at those Paul Ingridson videos on YouTube, he's got a number of them on composition. So just anything you can to, because it's like learning how to dissect paintings, just looking at them isn't always enough. And I've just been lucky to have a husband who is a painter and teacher and all of his friends are that. So oftentimes whenever we'd go to throughout our lives, whenever we go to DC, we might call in numerous friends that are living near there, Maryland and Philadelphia, and they, they come down. And so it'll be a group of us walking through a museum, looking at paintings, and they're all kind of teachers and they can talk. And so, I mean, that I considered my grad school because listening to these guys talking about painting in front of the painting was, I learned so much just that I would have never known. Um, but I bet you there's, you know, they were reading books. Um, too. And 
There's one uh, book that really has helped me a lot. It's incredibly hard to read. I just, I almost hesitate to even um, tell you about it, but it's it's a great book. Um, if you can just sort of slowly go through it, it's um, it's called The Principles of Art History by, mm. I think his name's Heinrich Wolflin. It's an old, it was, it was written in the 20s, like hundred years ago. And um, it's just a, you will understand art so much better if you read this and it divides and I actually taught a class based on it and I'll probably always kind of mention it in every class but it's it's basically choosing two um types of art because of course 1920 was when modernism was kind of getting going so he didn't include modernism he wasn't talking about that in his mind he divided art in the past into either classical or baroque and and the whole book is going through and looking at every aspect of painting and saying, how did the classical people do it and how did the Baroque people do it? And it will make you understand so much um, of how uh, paintings work if, by reading that. Wow, that's a really good one. I uh, Do we should have I, any I put the chat? I can type it in there if you want. Yeah, go ahead and put that in. Yeah, that's a great idea, Elizabeth. Um, do we have any other questions? Feel free to also unmute yourself and and just pipe up um, if you have something. Um, let me see if there's any hands raised. Let me go ahead and check on uh, Facebook Live. Um, we do have um, a question from Amy Scoggins. She says, materials question. Uh, what are your preferred paints, uh, surfaces, uh, mediums? I use linen. I only paint on linen. Um, that I have prime, used rabbit skin glue and oil primer on. I just like the surface. It's stiffer, um, slicker, the paint can move around. Something about whenever I paint it on canvas with canvas and sort of acrylic gesso go together and linen and primer go together. Um, so whenever I used to paint on canvas, which I did when I was younger and didn't have as much money, you know, trying to save money, I just felt like it was so absorbent and spongy. I had to make a painting before I could make a painting. Like I couldn't move the paint around and I'd make a painting and then finally sand it down at some point and then start again. And then the second time I painted it, I was like, this is great. Cause it's like, I had that surface, but <laughs> this is like that all the time. When I paint, I like the surfaces on the linen. It's just tougher and it's different. It has some give, but not too much. And um, paints, unfortunately, I don't know. I've never graduated from using Utrecht paints, which is what I've always used. And I, you know, I always kind of said when I was a student, well, when I get older and my work is better, I'll start getting really good paint. But um, I just use so much paint that I kind of cringe the thought, I mean, of expensive. My husband uses like Holbein paints and it just like, mm -hmm. I almost like want to pass out when I realize like a little teeny tube of yellow is like $40. I, like I couldn't do that. I would just be like, <gasps> So I couldn't play around if I thought that it was that much money, but I I have always liked Utrecht stuff. I use their brushes. I get I get pretty much everything from Utrecht, and I wait until things are on sale. There's always a paint sale and a brush sale where things are like half price, and that's when I stock up. And I've actually learned stuff like I mean I even buy um, a bunch of empty paint tubes, and then I buy the huge quarts or whatever of the white, and I can tube white or mix my own, you know, tints and stuff like that. And I found that that's much cheaper. Um, it's like half the price if you just get a big amount and either, you know, carefully use it out of the can or tube it. Um, that's one way that I do it. But I, I'm not super precious about actual paint. It's kind of weird. It's just because I want to be able to throw it around and not worry about it. And, um, you know, my... My son and my husband have a lot more um, fancier paints and they try all different kinds. Like, I feel like at this point with the colors, the basic colors that I use, um, I can mix most colors that I would want. So I could buy some fancy, you know, Mars, this or that, you know, some fancy kind of color, but half the time I get an ochre of some kind that's weird. I'm like, I could have mixed that with these three colors that I already have. So I'm, I don't know. I just stick with my, you know, it's, it, you get into habits in the studios, uh, unfortunately, but, or maybe fortunately, but that I'm just used to the paints that I use and that, I don't know. 
Let's see if we have any more questions here. I love all of this engagement. Uh, this is, um, and you, you just answer them so precisely, succinctly, Elizabeth. Let's see if you guys have any more questions, feel free to put them in chat. I know we're going a little bit over, but all of this is really good stuff. Um, so let me go check the Facebook Live again. You can also unmute yourself. Um, let me give everybody a time to kind of see if they want to chime in. I also get my frames now. Um, I frame them myself and I use um, Metro Frame. I think it might be out of Minneapolis, but I it's it's a kind of thing where you can order the sizes and the um, stain on it and stuff like that. And they send you the pieces of the frame all together and they've drilled wow. this kind of kind of butterfly thing in the corners. So when you put the frame together upside down, these things fit to the corners fit together and there's a little special peg that fits in that butterfly shaped hole and you tap wow. it together. It's so simple. It takes like less than five minutes to put them together. They look like professional and you're just not paying double to have someone else do that because that's what some framers doing for you. If you use float frames, that's what I use is kind of simple float frames, but there's, they even have other kinds too, but um, it's just saved me so much money. And so as my work has gotten bigger um, and I didn't even use to frame them when I was first starting, but as my work's gotten bigger, I started thinking, oh God, how am I going to, you know, it's going to be so expensive to frame these, but my husband's even started using it and he used the best framer in like Richmond. He used to spend like $500 a painting and like an 18 by 24 painting to frame it. And I was always like, I don't think I can do that. But this has really saved me from using this. So anyway, I recommend you can, um, you know, you can buy them yourself and they can, they're much cheaper because they come all taken apart and they come in a long box. So it's cheaper if you bought a frame that was already put together, that's an expensive thing to ship, but these, the way that they do it anyway, it's great. Metro frame. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, I've never heard of that. So I'll have to definitely look, look them up. I have a question. So do you, do you stretch all of your own canvases too? Absolutely. Yeah. And I used to do it in big amounts. And so I'm still going through the ones that I stretched from a while back, but um, I just, it's almost like for me, like a process that prepares me for painting. It's just all the chores of the studio help prepare me to paint. I just like thinking about the different sizes. I order a bunch of different stretcher bars and combine them in different ways. I like having a lot of different sizes. Um, my husband's worked for years with like 18, by, but with just a couple sizes. And so he does a lot of different composing within the same 18 by 24 rectangle. And I would always change the rectangle to make my, and it's just how I work. But um, so I like making my own and uh, I'm just used to doing it now. So I also gesso paper. I also buy uh, printmaking paper, really thick paper like um, Reeves BFK, I guess Stonehenge is another one. And, and then gesso it multiple times, like maybe three or four times until it's super stiff. And that's a great painting surface um, to do studies and preparatory things on. And it's so stiff that it will actually stand up and you could prop it somewhere like on a shelf or something like that if you had a little a little um, one of those. But I like to, I tell students sometimes to use that when I'm um, teaching. Um, we also have, uh, what is your palette? Do you use earth yeah. colors or do you mix? Them? Well, I've started to use earth colors more. I used to, I used to use kind of a double or triple primer. I used to take all the primary colors and have multiple two or three versions of each, at least a warm and a cool. So like a cadmium red light or medium and an alizarin crimson, something like that for a red. And, um, but then I, then I expanded out to not only the primaries, but the secondary colors. So I had two or three colors of, you know, yellow, red, and blue, and orange, green, and purple. Um, I had that for a long time. I avoided black just because I remember teachers saying, don't use black. It's really bad. It's hard. And you can't, you know, you really got to know what you're doing. So I was always afraid to use black. And then finally, at one time, I just put it on there. And now I love using it. But I've started adding um, earth colors now, I think more as a time saver. I could mix them. But, you know, there's only so much time. And I some there's nothing worse than spending like 10 or 15 minutes mixing a color, a big color, and then realizing, Oh my God, that's just yellow ochre. Like, 
<laughs> this has been 10 minutes. Oh, no, no. But I have a gym up right there. Oh, I, but that happens to me all the time. But, um, but yeah, I spend a lot of time mixing, um, mixing color. That's a big part of my studio practice. Um, and even just mixing color for its own sake. Like I'm not even looking necessarily at my setup sometimes when I'm mixing. I just want to look at the palette and see what I can do. What happens if I put these colors together and just mix all these puddles and and then have them there so that I can um, use them in a painting or, um, and even if it's to start a painting, um, drawing in with the wrong colors so that I can see like if, or if I'm reattacking a painting, I need to draw in with colors that are not there so I can see how I wanna change it. So if it's a very earthy colored painting, I might put an electric blue drawing in just to, cause that, then I can see what I wanna read, how I wanna redo it. But, um, so yeah, I just, I could spend a lot of time. I think if you want to be a colorist, you have to just love color period and just love looking at it and spending a lot of time thinking about it and mixing it. And, you know, instead of trying to match it, is that that color? Is this the right, you know, one of the best exercises I ever did was this landscape teacher made me um, make, start making my landscape paintings in purple. I couldn't use green. So the whole painting had to be <laughs> colors that were in the family of purple. And it just really got me out of like, because I was like a color matcher and I got really good at matching color, but it was sort of like such autopilot. And I, I wasn't, it, it took me out of the driver's seat of the painting. I wasn't in control of the painting. That's the color I'm looking at. It and I have to make that color. Well, I'm the one <laughs> making this painting. So I have to like, you know, so once I did start doing those purple landscapes, it's like, oh, it's just about the relationships. This is warmer than that. Mm -hmm. That's darker than this. You can still the create way. the vibe no matter what. So it's not about the, uh, you know, color has three parts to it. Um, tone, how dark or light it is. Um, intensity, how muted, you know, or intense pure out of the tube it is and then the hue and I think most people think the hue the literal color is the most important aspect of color that's the least important it doesn't matter you could look at a Bonard painting and it's a big you know red table let's say with stuff on it and he could have made that a yellow table it would have still been a great painting it's not the tone it's not the literal hue that he chose it's what he did with it how intense was it versus the thing next to it how dark or light was it it's the, the other aspects of color are much more important than the hue itself, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's really great. I love, let me see if there's any more questions. I do want to go ahead and start wrapping this up. Um, and, okay. And um, yeah, so I think I, I will go ahead and wrap up the Zoom. First, I want to say uh, thank you, Elizabeth Geiger sure. for kind of in joining us uh, in this kind of Zoom series. Uh, we, you know, we really appreciate you coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, I want to thank everybody who came and joined us, whether you're on Facebook Live or whether uh, you're with us today in Zoom. Um, uh, I think everyone really participated in the discussion as far as like uh, questions. I love to see lots of questions at the end. And even if we go a little bit early over, sometimes that, that happens. Um, and I think that's all I got. Um, I, I just want to, I just, I cannot thank uh, you enough, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, feel free to scroll up and see those uh, contact information, um, just her website, Instagram, social media for Elizabeth Geiger. Um, I definitely uh, suggest kind of looking at her work. Um, you know, I, I would just look at her work and just zoom in on it. Um, not to put any pressure on you, Elizabeth, but that's what I used to do. Um, it's just really great. Um, I'm so just ecstatic to have you here. Sure. Um, you can always message me on Instagram if you want. I, I will start looking at it, I promise. <laughs> I don't want to from it, but I will look at it now. So you can send me a question there. And, All right. Uh, thank do we you have so much. Uh, happy last minute here, comments. Friends. Yes, we got we got uh you know looks like Greta is so happy. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Ram. Um, it was such a joy to have you at our uh, lecture live series here at the Fort Smith Regional sure. Art Museum. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. So Bye. without further ado, I'll go ahead and end us here. Um, 
I just can't thank you enough. Sure. You guys have a great night. Bye. You too.